What is a feast to a poor hunter? Is it an entire buffalo? Is it a loaf of bread? Or is it a full belly and a successful hunt? One of the most difficult and dangerous jobs in the 18th century was that of the professional hunter. He had to endure an environment that was against him. He had to survive off of his surroundings. He had to be able to fix any of his equipment. At any point, he might become injured, get sick, run out of supplies, he might even die. Today, I want a victory for this poor hunter. We are going to make him a feast. There's an amazing time period between 1760 and about 1775 where there are lots of long hunters, professional hunters out in the deep frontier and they are collecting, they're harvesting deer and beaver hides specifically for export to Europe. The industry was certainly around a hundred years before this, but all through that time period, it was done by Native Americans. It wasn't until we get to about 1760 where there is a generation of people that have grown up in North America that have the skills to go out into the frontier to do this kind of hunting. It is not easy to do. In fact, it is full of difficulties. Now we certainly have hunting today and most of the hunting is going on as a recreation or possibly some people use it to fill their freezer with food. That is certainly going on in the 18th century. Plenty of people are using wild game to put food on the table. But the professional hunters we're talking about here are not necessarily going for food. They're going for the hides of the animals. And they are spending not weeks or a day out in the woods, but months. In fact, an entire year out in the woods trying to harvest as many deer and beaver hides as possible. This hunting is going on east of the Mississippi. There are lots of different kinds of game in the woods. You could probably think of the king of the forest in that time period, even east of the Mississippi, was the buffalo, the bison. There are lots of bison, not as many as there would be west of the Mississippi, where there are giant herds, tens of thousands of buffalo. For the professional hunter, you might think this would be the most sought after animal, but it turns out that the hides were not very valuable. Buffalo can be very, very difficult to kill. You couldn't use the hides for sale. You might use the hides for other purposes. You might use them for uh, creating coverings for your deer hide that you are selling, but you're not generally going out and hunting lots of buffalo unless you're starving. And of course, the frontier is filled with other kinds of wild game, bear and elk. Again, both very useful, but they aren't the cash crop. They're not the one you're really going after so that you can take something back from the frontier to the civilized areas and make a lot of money. We do have situations where people are processing bison, maybe even salting it and sending it to Fort Pitt. But if it's going to go out east and it's meat, well, venison's probably much better. But again, the cash crop is the hide. Hundreds of thousands of hides are being shipped off every year to Europe for processing. This is the most valuable product these hunters can come back to civilization with. Probably the most famous long hunter name is Daniel Boone. The kind of person who grew up in this area and had the kinds of skills that it took to survive for months and months at a time and live off the land. The main dish today is tongue. It's a very interesting cut of meat. There are times in our 18th century context where if you're going to take any particular piece of meat off an animal, then you're going to take the very best. The tongue being the very best cut of meat off of the buffalo, it's a win for the long hunter. It's a little interesting to prepare, at least in this kind of primitive cooking situation. We need to sear the tongue to get the skin to come off of it. Many times if we're cooking a tongue today, we will poach it or boil it and then be able to take the skin off the outer side. It's not so easy here by the campfire. We're just gonna put it really close to the fire and get it to dry a little bit so we can peel it off. And then we're just going to put it on a wooden stake and roast it over the fire. This was written in 1779. First scorch the tongue a little, then peel off the outside coating, then stick it on a spit made of spice bush with the lower end in the ground. If no spice bush is at hand, a sassafras branch 
works just as well. So what did one of these hunting expeditions look like? It was lasting, again, months. Not weeks, not days, months, or even a year, possibly even longer. If you're gonna be bringing lots of things out of the frontier, you have to have some way to carry that. Someone's gonna have a minimum of three or four pack horses, possibly many more. Because you wanna come out with as many hides as possible, it's the only way for your trip to be profitable at all. And these expeditions aren't just a single person. You're going into a very, very dangerous environment. There are times when you have to defend yourself, and so you really can't do that with one person. So they're going out in larger groups, three and four, maybe a half a dozen or a dozen men. You've got a camp, or a camp at least for a while. You might have to move from one spot to the other as you're hunting. You're gonna have a half shelter like this, and you're again killing a lot of deer or beaver. Those animals have to be butchered, their skin has to be taken off, and then has to be processed. You can't just take a raw hide with you. You have to sort of half tan them so that you can pack them up and ship them out, and they have to last for months. You know, the ones you kill at the beginning have to last until you're ready to come out of the frontier. So it is a very dirty, nasty, hard job. It is all day long. You're going out hunting, you're bringing back the animals, you're processing, and starting out again the next day. There's a clash of cultures going on here with the hunters coming off of the coast, and then we've got Native Americans. And the Native Americans here, they're not a monolith. You have different tribes, and sometimes they're at war with each other, at the same time, they're basically at war with these long hunters. So it is an incredibly dangerous spot to be. But it's not just people that you have to worry about. You have to worry about bears. You have to worry about mountain lions. You have to worry about buffalo. They're very dangerous animals to interact with, as well as something like elk. You're so deep in this forest that you're weeks away from resupply of just about anything. If your equipment breaks, you have to be able to fix it and the most important thing to these hunters was their gun. That's a complicated piece of equipment in our 18th century situation, and you've got nothing but a campfire and maybe a very small hammer and a little hand vise to fix anything that might break. Another delicacy for these long hunters is bone marrow, and it's sort of the opposite of tongue. Tongue is a very easy thing to harvest from an animal. The bone marrow can be very difficult to harvest from the animal, so you've got to carve all the meat away to get to the bones. And you have to have a very large bone to get any decent marrow out of it. But the bones that were roasted, the marrow would soften up and they could scoop it out and spread it on bread or johnny cakes for that very, very special flavor. I was trying to think of a comparison that we would have today, a job that we could do today that would be anything similar to what was happening with these 18th century hunters. Maybe you've seen the show Deadliest Catch. You're out there on the seas for months at a time. Or maybe the job of somebody on an oil rig. Again, away from civilization for months at a time, no real connection. These people usually have all their supplies along with them. The hunters, on the other hand, they were living on the environment for all that time. There are many times on the channel where we've talked about people in the 18th century using every little bit of something. So not letting anything go to waste. The hunters here are in a situation that many times is just the opposite. They are in a land of bounty. There are times when there is way more meat than anyone could possibly eat and they'll just take little bits of an animal, the very, very best parts, and the rest they will just leave to rot. And yet, three or four days later, they're out of anything to eat and they are starving. This feast or famine situation is not with just these 18th century long hunters. It's happening with the Native Americans who are doing the same kind of hunting. When the hides are the cash crop, it doesn't matter whether they're Native Americans or these 18th century hunters, the meat part is not important, and so it just goes to waste. Johnny Cakes would be another win for our long hunter. Ground corn, maize, that's something that they can bring along with them to the frontier. They might not want to use very much at a time, because you can only bring so much. 
but that's that last little flavor of home that you can bring along with you. It's very easy to cook and it has that amazing flavor that you're missing once you're out on this frontier for months and months at a time. This would be a line of work for a very special kind of person. Somebody who is able to live off the land for months at a time. Someone who's able to hunt and harvest animals by the hundreds if need be. Someone who is able to fix their own equipment. Somebody who's able to fight off bears and mountain lions and buffalo. He was somebody who could handle the pressure of living in this kind of environment. This is the Poor Hunter's Feast and it is very good.